Welcome back, everyone. This is The Nerdy Truth, and I'm your host, Dr. JJ Walcott. Our focus is on harnessing citizen innovation to help build our country for the future. Today, we have the opportunity to talk with a world traveler who has been looking at worldwide politics and the changes that have been occurring and is now bringing all that information and lessons learned to the United States. So we're excited to learn from him about what he's seen. And during this time when we can't all travel, this is probably a great time to learn about someone else's travel, maybe walk a few footsteps uh, in their shoes. So without further ado, let's bring in our guest. Hello. Welcome in today. It is so great to have you with us, Michael. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is uh, allow you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your very background and oh. uh, tell us a little about your travels. You know, so many of us can't travel at this point that it's great <laughs> to uh, have the opportunity to maybe uh, live in your shoes for a few minutes. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and thanks for inviting me on the show. Well, I, you know, in 2016, I've, I've been a political, oh, uh, consultant and analyst and writer for many years and at one point was a senior advisor to the California Democratic Party and then you know got out of that completely and I started something called the Courage Campaign in California which today has about 1.5 million members and I frankly don't care with about most of what they're doing now but I'm proud of the fact that I started it and it gave me an opportunity to travel the state and meet all kinds of different activists and see the things that people were doing in their communities. And that eventually led to this 2016 epiphany. And it really had started long before that, that, okay, this system is so broken and so brain dead. It really is, we have to just go right back to uh, your favorite term, the whiteboard, and come <laughs> up with a new model. We have to, it, you can't tweak this or play with it around the edges, it was my thinking. And so I voted absentee, I hit the road basically. I said, I'm gonna just start traveling and see visiting friends in Europe and, and then in Latin America and across the US to see what people are actually doing outside of the party matrix. And, and it was, I didn't really expect to find very much. You know, there's this book written many years ago, I think in the 1980s by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, and it was about the decline of civil association in uh, the United States. Uh, you know, I guess we could update that now. Sherry Turkle. I was thinking the same. <laughs> Sherry, Sherry Turkle from MIT wrote a book called Together Alone. <laughs> uh, how We're going to see a media... lot more of it. Yeah, well, she was ahead of her time, and she was talking about how social media has... Uh, Put us together but we're still alone we're in our little silos and now that's on steroids of course but you know i started traveling i said well, what's what's going on in the rest of the world and again i did not expect to find a great deal but i, I was shocked the amazing civic innovation just citizen driven innovation in, in communities all over the world was a, just stunning to me and i started a project uh, about a year later after being on the road for a year called reimagining politics and it's all about just showcasing these different models of citizen innovation. Here's what you do when you really want to get creative. And interestingly, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but I'll let you decide. Most of this innovation occurs uh, when there's some tragic event or some catastrophic um, series of events that a community can't deal with through their typical mechanisms. Uh, the Atocha train station bombing in Madrid, for example, bombings, I should say, resulted in a, a project called uh, Vivero de Iniciativa Ciudadanas, which is Nursery of Citizens Initiatives. And that led to something called civics. I don't remember what this, the civics acronym stands for, but it's civics, right? And so you can go to the website, civics. I don't know, put org and it'll give you the right... <laughs> It just does it automatically. And it's basically this interactive mapping of grassroots volunteer citizens organizations that are nonpartisan completely, you know, helping elderly shut-ins, building community gardens, um, uh, just all, all, anything you can think of that needs to be done in a community. It's that spirit of civil association. And I found that's very much alive everywhere. It, it was shocking to me. And so, you know, we started teaching university seminars. It's an educational initiative, really. Not, we're 
you know, of course we have political views, but that's, that's not the important part. The important part is just showing here's what citizens are doing. And the university seminars we've done, the students are, they're thrilled to have this information because here are these young kids, they're 19, 20, 21 years old, and they're being told the world's coming to an end. They don't have any power to change it. And, you know, it's just so gloomy. And they're actually, if you scratch the surface a little bit, they're, they're often depressed. And you know, we're telling them the opposite. No, you are the future. Don't, don't buy this line of hooey that the world's going to end. You know, that's BS. Um, and you have the power to make change. Look at what these citizens all over the world are doing. And, you know, I tried to pick models to showcase that are what I call duplicable and scalable. You know, they're having a real impact in the real world and they can be duplicated and they can be scaled. And the rest is up to the people who, to whom you show these initiatives. And I think young people are the right place to start, frankly, because you no, know, wow, it's a new vista for them, a new vision, a new, a new, you know, shifting the angles of perception about what is actually possible. And these projects run, I'm talking too much here, but these projects run the gamut from this very uh, sophisticated uh, civic mapping in Spain, which has now become a thing. There's, there's interactive maps all over the city. There's ma civic maps for little kids. It's, it's just a brilliant, beautiful initiative. And they're partnered with something called Media Lab Prado, uh, which is kind of a state-sponsored incubator for civic projects like this in Spain. A wonderful model, just full of great stuff. It's intergenerational. It's experimental. It mixes art and politics and civic innovation. And it's, it's, a, it's something, you know, I wish we had a media lab Prado in every community. Uh, and, you know, that it was, it's another good model to look at. And they incubated this uh, civics map, social mapping project. And then they, you know, they, now it's a partnership with a bunch of organizations. They've got tens of thousands of these initiatives mapped. And not just in Spain now, it's spreading all across Latin America. I think there's eight countries. They've mapped thousands of initiatives in Mexico City and Guadalajara, for example, in Mexico. So um, then in uh, uh, Santiago de Chile, <clears throat> I was there to talk about teaching a university seminar. And I went out with a bunch of the faculty folks for happy hour one day. And the woman sitting next to me was married to one of the professors. And I said, her name was Javier. I said, Javier, what do you do? And she said, oh, I run something called Quero Mi Barrio, which means I love my neighborhood. I said, my God, what a beautiful name. What do, what do you do? She said, very little. <laughs> she said, we go into the communities and we show them that somebody cares, that we love them, you know? And we ask them, do you love your neighborhood? And the answer inevitably is yes, but it's a mess. What do we do? And so it's educational. It's sometimes it's as simple as signage and paint and sprucing up a community garden or you know, coming up with uh, pro programs, after school programs with partnership with other organizations. And so it's just sh showing up and showing attention. It doesn't cost very much at all. And then we've got in, also in the Andes, you know, spreading across the Andes now is a, uh, something that's an ancient tradition among the, uh, the Mapuche tribe, which was the fiercest the tribe was never conquered. It was one of the only Native American tribes that was never conquered. They kept retreating into the Andes and they could never get them. They did enormous damage to the conquistadores. So they're, they're legendary throughout South America. Well, the, a few years ago, the elders, I'm going to say 10 years ago, started noticing, damn, my kids are glued to their phone all day long. What do, what do we do about this? And so they revived an ancient tradition called Trafquinto. And Trafquinto is... Uh, you know, was all across the Andes at one point. The, the tr various tribes would get together a couple times a year and they would give one another gifts. They called them gifts. And it, was, it, was, it had to be something that was just given freely. And so the whole, all the different branches of all the different tribes would get together a couple times a year and exchange gifts. And they also exchanged seeds. They wanted to, you know, which seeds were working best. They were preserving the uh, gen purity and genetic diversity of their seed stock. And that, that kind of thing, the seed has changed. The, that's happening in Mexico. It's happening now in the, the Southern Cone in Argentina and Uruguay, because they've been taken over by these, you know, mon companies like Monsanto and so forth. So you just find one after another, the more you dig beneath, beneath the surface, the more you find them. 
And so that's, that's my mission right now is reimagining politics. And it isn't me who's reimagining politics. It's people all over the world. They're already doing it. You just have to find them and connect them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to raise money. Every time I get ready to launch this thing anew, something happens. I was caught in an earthquake in Mexico City in 2017 that, you know, destroyed the apartment I was living in, destroyed my office. And, you know, that set me back. And now we've got a pandemic. And <clears throat> so, but uh, uh, my latest thing is a, a new, I'm using Substack to create a new subscriber based newsletter, you know, a little modest monthly fee. And I'll have guests on these innovators that I've met across the world. I'll launch that within the next couple of weeks, probably. So and where can someone follow you on that? Well, it's my last name, Muir, M-E-U-R-E-R dot substack dot com. Perfect. So we'll add that it, on as well. It's, it's not catchy like you know, <laughs> zoom dot com would be so easy, right? Something like that. <clears throat> it's one of those things where you have to send out the link to folks, I think. But Yeah, well, we can certainly post it. And to well, so let me unpack a lot of what you just said, because this is an incredible journey. And ironically so incredibly similar to what I did across the United States and found some similarities to what you found as well, which is that there are enormous mm. numbers of ideas um, and everyday citizens who are, are making a difference in their community. Um, sometimes it's simple, like you pointed out, they are there to participate, they are there to provide uh, inspiration or support, food, whatever caring means they need to. Uh, in other cases, it is. It's highly sophisticated. Uh, when we were in Texas, mm -hmm. there was a group that had thought, well, it's not enough to try and create an incubator. We have to actually teach people how to go through this process of, of getting capital. And they nobody comes in with an idea that everybody, that where they can do it all on their own. So how do we make the connections for them? And they, they really took on the education of being entrepreneurial beyond being just an innovative mind. And so when you get into that kind of a more sophisticated setup, there, there's a lot more to that model. But, but similarly found these models of excellence, if you will, and innovation all over the country. And so it begged the question, and certainly I saw the exact same pattern across the United States government, which is to say that we have a ton of programs. Not only do American citizens not know uh, exist, but neither do the administrations most of the time, which <laughs> comes with so many problems. What are mm -hmm. we spending our money on? A lot of times great work. It's just not necessarily being advertised. So the question that come, came to mind when I was in government was how do we connect these programs and get them to uh, the United States citizens? When I left government and went around the country, I said, well, now I see the same pattern in the U.S. How do we connect these programs and bring them to government? Now I talk with you and think, how do we take these models that you found of connection, which is the part that I think in our country is really missing, and make them appropriate for the United States? I don't think it's a hard sell, although I don't know that it's, it's happening in the um, media world right now, but I don't think it's a hard sell to help people realize that we have a lot of great people in this country, a lot of communities, like you said, who love their communities and would like to make them better but I think it is difficult to build the trust required to do the connection. And it's difficult to determine who and how do we manage those connections. It's really I, kind of a knowledge management scenario. For me, it's not. I, I run away from anything that has the word management in it. I don't want to manage anything. I just want to show. You okay. know, it's, it's, I just think that's the most, the the most effective way of teaching. And, uh, and it isn't even showing what, necessarily what I know, it's just showing what I've found, and what these people are doing. And I th I'm kind of moving away from the idea of government as a separate entity. I think that, uh, I mentioned last time we talked, uh, Helene Landemore, yes. this professor originally from France, at, and she's at Yale University. They did a big feature story on her at the New Yorker about a month ago. And Helene is talking about, um, let's just get rid of representative government. <clears throat> There's a young political, <clears throat> excuse me, a young political um, 
analyst named Walker Bragman. And Walker says, our elected leaders are neither. They're neither elected, nor are they leaders. Uh, and they're not elected because they're just picked by the donor class. <clears throat> and they're certainly not leaders as we see every day. So how do we just start disengaging from that model? And the citizens models that I found, and citizens is almost too fancy of a term. They're just, they're just members of a community who got together to solve a problem. And they're way, way off the radar. They've been mainstream media would probably look at them and just not see anything worthwhile, frankly. But for I'll give you a very specific example. I was invited by a woman with a community gardening project. She's a doctor uh, and a Japanese Mexican woman, <clears throat> excuse me, and she invited me to Salta, or uh, uh, Salto, perdón, uh, in Mexico. It's outside, about an hour outside of Guadalajara. And I, as we're driving out there, we're driving past the Corridor Industrial, so the industrial corridor, where all these factories, many of them courtesy of NAFTA, are plopped alongside the Rio Santiago. Uh, it's one of the longest rivers in the Americas. Well, that river is so polluted. There, when you get to Salto, it's, it's, uh, Salto means jump. Well, there's a big fall or cascada, a big falls. It used to be called the Niagara of Mexico. And people came from all over the United States, some from Europe, from Canada. They camped there, they swim there, they fished there, it was pristine. Well, fast forward 40 or 50 years after NAFTA, this thing is so toxic, you cannot walk over the bridge <clears throat> between Salta and, uh, Salto and uh, the Wanakatlan, the other village next door. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> got a terrible frog in my throat, I apologize. You cannot walk across that bridge without covering your face. The, the foaming waves of pollution are unbelievable. Uh, Vice magazine calls it the river of death. I mean, there's been all kinds of publicity about this thing. So the farmers in the community said, you know, we, we can't live like this anymore. So they, they've been building their own water purification systems and they've opted out of the, a lot of this pollution is coming from, uh, industrial scale agriculture, again, which was, uh, I want to say, encouraged by NAFTA. It really exploded after NAFTA was signed. And NAFTA did enormous damage. It gutted the Constitution of Mexico and a whole bunch of nasty stuff. Um, you know, we, we, we complain about NAFTA. It was a bad deal for everybody in a sense, but the, these guys just opted out the guys, these men and women opted out of the system basically and started their own seed exchanges. There were over a hundred people there that day. And a young guy got up and he'd been traveling around Mexico. He'd been to almost every state in the country meeting with other farmers who were doing the same thing. They have a nationwide network. They don't have a lot of money. Their website barely functions, but they are, were gracious enough to include me in their newsletter. And I was knocked out. This guy's name is Alan Carmona Gutierrez. And Alan got up to speak and he said, las semillas son las armas que pueden ganar la guerra contra capitalismo. And I said, oh my God, where am I? Seeds are the arms that can win the war against capitalism. Well, okay. Maybe you're a pro-capitalist person. You love the idea of the market and so forth. And he's a little too radical for you. But he's talking about a particular kind of capitalism that just poisoned the river that he's lived alongside of his whole life. Kids are dying from, you know, I mean, it's just horrible. And so, of course, they're opting out. And this model of capitalism absolutely doesn't work for them. <clears throat> so they're finding alternative ways to uh, conduct their lives as farmers. They've, they've embraced... Uh, ancient traditions and kind of modernize them and they're keeping their genetic seed stock diverse and and uh, free of you know GMOs and that kind of thing and so it was it was stunning it was really quite a thing to see and to walk around and talk to these folks Alan and I became friends I've seen him I whenever I'm in the area I go visit him <clears throat> and uh, you know he continues experimenting with new things to improve the community well you can't really duplicate that. You can just show somebody that model, right? Uh, the social mapping in Spain, definitely you can duplicate. Uh, the, uh, the uh, Quiero Mi Barrio, I Love My Neighborhood, you can definitely duplicate that. And there, there are many, many programs you can duplicate. 
Um, and you know, the, then you find other projects that are very specific to a, a particular community. And there's still things to learn there as well. Like how do you adapt to a, a community that's, uh, for example, there's a, a really unloading a lot of stuff here, but there's a little village in Argentina called Carlos Caceres. Well, how did they get a name like that? Well, that's the name of a former governor and he's sort of an icon in the area. And this little village is half Italian Catholics and half Jewish. <laughs> so I have a friend who grew up there and he said, yeah, he said, we, the thing that united us all, we all went to the same building for our services and the same building for school. It's a really tiny little place. It's growing now, it's a few thousand people. But he said, um, the thing that united us was Peronismo. We all learned the hundred rules of Peronismo. I said, what? I said, I said, the hundred rules of Peronismo. Tell me more about this. And he says, well, just a minute. And he ran upstairs. This is late at night. We've had a big asado and we're finishing up the wine and so forth. And he um, comes down with this little uh, blue book and it's the hundred rules of Peronismo. Cien reglas de Peronismo. And he knew them by heart. Everybody in the village did. They still have the, the kids from his class, from his generational cohort, they still get together regularly, have big asados and talk politics and so forth. And they've done some really innovative things in this village just based on this unique culture. All the people who grew up there probably now live in, you know, Cordoba or Mendoza or Buenos Aires, but they come back. Uh, regularly and they're very involved in the community. They created a program for uh, eliminating plastic bags that is now a model. <clears throat> the city of Buenos Aires is studying it and is <clears throat> probably going to adopt some version of it. You know, just th that unique culture. Well, lots of communities have some unique set of circumstances that they can, ex uh, you know, exploit in a positive way. And so that's another lesson, right? Take what's, what's unique in your community that you can use to leverage and, and make some sort of a really brilliant civic innovation. I love it's, it. It's, it's, it's the thing of, you know, a thousand flowers blooming. We, we have to restore, every, the health of any ecosystem depends on diversity. And that's true of your a civic ecosystem as well. And so the more diverse, we, you know, we want a thousand flowers to bloom. We want a thousand models for people to, to choose from or combine in new ways. <clears throat> so, that, you know, that's... Yeah. I love your, your approach <clears throat> say in psychology. There tends to be two ways to help people. One is to fix their problems. <laughs> I pause for drama. drama. The yeah, other, right. the one I subscribe to is find something that's working <clears throat> and do more of it. And so I, I love the way that you have said, I don't need to manage other people. And I would agree with you, bit of a setup. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm a terrible manager. I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's the right answer though. We don't need to manage people. We don't need to control or govern people to the extent that sometimes that we do. What we do need to do sometimes is inspire or showcase those things that are working. Get people thinking about, well, if that works there, how might I use a portion of it? Or how might it just help me to start thinking about how I can be involved as well? And uh, your approach to say, let me at least arm you with information. Let me arm you with stories. Let me give you the tools and inspiration you need to, to make those changes here in your community. When those just organically connect together, that is the definition of true grassroots, isn't it? <laughs> it is, you know, and I, I don't like that term grassroots anymore because- I, I know, it now comes with a connotation, yes. Yeah, no, I, it's, no I, we all use it, but you know, it, now it comes with, uh, you know, whacktivists, and we call them on both the left and the right. And, you know, they've stopped thinking they're in their little silos. So I, I like to stay outside of that matrix <laughs> if I can. But I, I think there, there was always been something missing that, and until I discovered Helene Landemore, I, I really didn't, uh, I didn't have a model to, how do you make all this stuff connect? How do you put it together? <clears throat> it, it, just in a theoretical sense, is there a model that could connect all of this stuff in a way that would really be impactful on a mega level? And I think she's, she's onto something. It's just one model, but it's basically that citizenship becomes obligatory through either a draft or, you know, there's some sort of um, civic duty and people have to solve their own problems. You don't rely on elected representatives. 
And this gets tricky. There's no simple solution here, right? You know, there's a million variables you have to think about. So this, at this point, it's still very theoretical, but it's a, it's a construct that I think uh, could be like an overarching grid or something, a theoretical construct that all these various initiatives could plug into uh, so that we do become more self-governing. Yes. Uh, and you know, when, you, when you have to solve problems, when you're forced to work together, like if there's a flood in your community or something, it's amazing. We find ways to do it, right? We do. We absolutely do. And I found it over and over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. throughout the country. And in fact, on the government end, uh, it, through some of the human-centered design innovation programs, we are asking these questions from the inside of government. In other words, how do we, how do we open the government aperture to include citizens so that those great ideas are flowing and not quite so managed, instead elevated, connected, and used for, for everybody's benefit. Uh, so it's not such a top-down structure, but more of that integrated um, collaboration space. And you're right, I think it's gotta come with the citizens um, and we, we've got to be able to elevate their ideas because never ever will it be the case that one group of people has uh, a singular best idea for everyone. <laughs> that's, that's an equation that won't work. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're in such a difficult position right now because people can't even talk to one another. Oh. They're filling themselves with, you know, either Fox News or MSNBC, I'll just use those two examples with these ideas, or they're going to Vox or they're going to Prager University and they get their prepackaged arguments and then they argue. <laughs> and uh, that's not a healthy model. No. Um, and, you know, I, I think that just getting people to, to talk to one another is the initial challenge that we're so quick to put labels on people. Um, and I, I just, that obviously doesn't work. No, but I think your idea may, may have some significant merit and I hope that uh, we continue co to connect and elevate these citizen ideas. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. This is The Nerdy Truth and I'm your host, Dr. J.J. Walcott. Thank you, J.J. It was a pleasure.